Welcome back to another episode of Honestly Bilal. I'm your host, Bilal Med, and I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Toledo. And this is Honestly Bilal, the show for the aspiring ophthalmologist, where I sit down and talk with medical students who are interested in ophthalmology, with the residents who are training in ophthalmology, and with current ophthalmologists in the field today. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Dr. Richard Davidson. Dr. Davidson is a, is a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Colorado. He's the co-medical director for the Rocky, Rocky Mountain Lions Eye Bank, the co-director for the Cornea and External Disease Fellowship, and also the vice chair for clinical affairs and quality for the University of Colorado Health Eye Center. So Dr. Davidson, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate you being here. Thanks, Bob. Well, it is definitely a tongue twister. There's lots of words in our names. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. So, you know, I like to ask all my guests uh, the same start off question here. So, you know, tell us about your origin story in ophthalmology. What got you interested in the field? And then also uh, in your subspecialty of cornea. It's a great question. You know, like many of us, most of us did not go to medical school thinking we were going to go into ophthalmology. And in part, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, it's because we don't get a lot of exposure to ophthalmology at a young age. So, I went into medical school thinking I was going to do primary care, either pediatrics or some kind of internal medicine maybe cardiology. As I progressed through medical school, I realized I didn't really love that so much and really took an interest in orthopedics so much so that I did a sub eye in, in orthopedics. and was very gung-ho of going into sports medicine, orthopedics. Um, and then very late in my third year, I actually went and spent a day with my uncle in the OR, who's an ophthalmologist and who I've known my entire life, but really never fully understood what he did. And I knew that I got glasses from him, but, um, Never paid much attention, unfortunately. And I spent a day watching cataract surgery. I was like, whoa, this is amazing. This is everything I was looking for. You know, what, what I realized as I was going through this process is that I didn't like inpatient medicine at all. Um, I didn't enjoy rounding. Um, it was interesting from an intellectual standpoint, but I didn't feel like I was making a huge impact in someone's quality of life. Meaning, you know, these patients would come into the hospital, we would tune them up, We'd get them out and a lot of times they would bounce back. And I just didn't like that type of workflow. I didn't feel like I was helping patients as much. I watched a cataract surgery, I was blown away. I thought, wow, you could take someone who's bedridden, but if you can improve their vision, you've improved their quality of life. And, and that's really what sold me. So I like the, the outpatient basis of it. I like the, the surgical aspect of it. I like the instant gratification, but it's also kind of high risk, high reward, you know, meaning what we do is complex, you know. Um, cataract surgery is not easy, but it is very rewarding. And I like the challenge of trying to not only do the surgery well, but I like the challenge of meeting pa patients, refractive needs, things like that. So that was my cell on ophthalmology. And it's definitely the best field for any med students thinking about it. Awesome. And I think, uh, you know, that's one of the things I've really realized is, as my, in my journey as a medical student, what you touched on there as well is, uh, I think when you get to your clinical rotations as a medical student, you don't realize maybe what it's really like to be on an inpatient setting on a day-to-day -day basis when you're rotating yes. through a specialty like internal medicine or cardiology or something like that. And I think it's easy to kind of have an idea of the specialties, but not until you see the daily workflow. And I, I agree with you. I think the outpatient basis of ophthalmology is pretty nice if you prefer that over the inpatient uh, setting. And I think, like you mentioned, instant gratification is nice sometimes, especially when things can be delayed, especially in healthcare today. It's things like some... Yeah specialties, it's almost hard to make an improvement, it seems like. So I think that's the cool thing about ophthalmology, like you mentioned, that you can have an objective difference, especially in vision, where it's where easy to measure. It's Absolutely. something that you can see a change in. So I agree with you. And, and we also get, you know, I think Malik Cook mentioned this in your podcast, we get the generational aspect of it too. So we get to follow patients for many years. We get to know them, know their families a little bit, um, you know, and so that's a very, so that's one thing I liked about primary care without having to do the primary care. So I think having that generational aspect of it's very nice too. Right, right. And especially in ophthalmology where you can also be that, if you're a comprehensive ophthalmologist or you can really be that, uh, the go-to person for that person's, you know, all their eye care needs for a long time, or if you're special yeah. yourself in cornea, then there's uh, that yeah. setting too, so. Oh, cornea, I was supposed to talk about that, right? So um, yeah, it, it's a great question. I didn't go into ophthalmology uh, gung-ho on any specific fellowship, wasn't even sure if I was gonna do a fellowship, thought I might do comprehensive. Um, but as I was going through my residency, I realized I did want to have a little bit more of a subspecialty. And that was based on some of the interactions I'd had with some of my mentors during residency. I liked the fact that they could sort of really dig in and be really knowledgeable about a very specific aspect of the eye. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, I didn't want to give up cataract surgery. So that pretty much ruled out retina, ruled out plastics, ruled out peds. Um, and at the time, um, 
I just found cornea more interesting, the corneal transplants, even though it's evolved so much since then, I personally found it more interesting than the glaucoma cases. But I did think about glaucoma too, because I thought it was also very challenging and I liked the challenge of that. And, and I thought cornea was very challenging, but I, I thought cornea more aligned with my interest because it tied in my desire to do refractive as well. And so that's, I was going between cornea and glaucoma and that's why I chose cornea. Gotcha. And that's, uh, that's the other thing I think we should, we should emphasize for medical students who are out there who may know about ophthalmology, but they not, may, may not know about the specific subspecialties, uh, yes. certain subspecialties where you continue to do cataract surgery, uh, like you mentioned in cornea, glaucoma, yes. uh, even pediatrics, some people continue to do cataract surgery and even medical retina, some people do cataract surgery still. Right. But then there's obviously, like you mentioned, there's sub such, some subspecialties where you kind of give up cataract surgery a little bit. So yeah, it depends on where you practice, the type, the nature of your practice. Um, some people don't realize that there's you know nine or ten subspecialties in ophthalmology, which is amazing when you think about such a small organ being so subspecialized. Um, it's fascinating, I think. Yeah, yeah. So and that's another thing. I mean, uh, we mentioned a lot about what you've done in in in, in your career. But another thing you've done is you were the director of medical student education for ten years at the University of Colorado. So. You know, again, the, the show is meant for medical students who may not know much about ophthalmology, but they're kind of interested in it. So what can you tell students who are, you know, just trying to get their feet wet and learning more about ophthalmology and what you think is something to keep in mind if they want to pursue the career uh, and how they can be successful in maybe, you know, matching ophthalmology throughout medical school, what they can do to get more involved? Absolutely. The first thing I would say is, you know, try and get some exposure early on. We had a med student the other day who's a first year who had a free time between her block and had heard about ophthalmology, she came and spent a couple of hours with us. Like, I think that's great. I think, you know, the biggest issue nowadays in med school is they, the students don't get a lot of exposure to ophthalmology and that hasn't changed. I didn't either, you know? So um, my encouragement would be to try and spend some time with ophthalmologists, even if you're just shadowing a little bit and see if it really suits you. And, you know, definitely try and reach out and find a mentor. And it may not be someone at your institution. I heard your podcast with Ike Ahmed the other day and, um, you know, he was talking about the fact that he went up to this, you know, big name ophthalmologist at a meeting, shook his hand, said, I'm really interested in ophthalmology. And the guy kind of blew him off. Well, I had a very similar experience at my home institution when I was a med student. When I finally made the decision to go into ophthalmology, I went to this person who was a very big name in ophthalmology. And I asked him for some guidance and mentorship. And he pretty much blew me off. He's like, well, I don't really mentor med students anymore. And, and really, I was so disappointed. And so... I went elsewhere. I went and uh, I started to do a rotation at Will's Eye Hospital because I was in Philadelphia. And I ran into Ed Jager, who's an ophthalmologist, and he was the director of med student education at the time. And unfortunately, he just passed away recently. But he was amazing. Like He kind of took me under his wing as a mentor, and it really helped me throughout my career. So I would say, find someone that's going to help you. It may not be at your home institution, but there are people out there who are willing to give back. And I think all of us should be giving back because we all we're med students at some point. We were all were residents at some point. So it's important to realize n none of us got to where we are without a little bit of help somewhere along the way. And, and so that's why I enjoyed being the director of med student education. And I liked getting students exposed to ophthalmology. It's really fun to see that wow factor when people come in, you know, they may just be rotating on a two week surgical rotation and then and not really knowing what they're doing with ophthalmology, just kind of checking it out. And then when they see what they do, what we do in the OR, it's amazing to watch. And so it's, it was fun to A, get back and B, kind of help um, open up our great field to other students. Awesome. And, and like I mentioned, you've been at the University of Colorado for, for some time and, and you've uh, <laughs> done a lot while you've been there. And, you know, the, the department has done really well. And then just recently, they were named the number 12th ranked residency program in, in the country by Ophthalmology Times. So, you know, obviously great honor. So what are some things about the program that make it really strong? What are some things that you've seen over the years that have made it improve a lot more? And, and what are you excited about as uh, someone who's part of the residency program and, and something that you would like for us to know about it? Well, thank you for that question. Um, first of all, we're very proud of it, of the program. We're very proud of the ranking. Um, it's, it's been a work in progress and we're still continuing to work on this. You know, nothing's perfect, but we're very proud of where we are. You know, when I joined the faculty, I came straight out of fellowship, it was 2002, it was a small practice, probably less than 10 of us, and we were seeing about 10,000 patients a year, and now we're seeing over 130,000 patients a year, and there's probably, I don't know, 50 of us, plus, you know, 30 basic scientists, so it's, it's grown exponentially, really big. Uh, but at the core of the program is the faculty, and we all really care about the program. We all like each other as human beings. We don't have the politics that some programs have 
and we all care about the residency. You know, um, I'll never forget hearing a, um, a lecture, I think it was when I was in medical school or, or early in residency, by someone who said, you know, it was talking about academic medicine, and he said, remember, you know, you have that name professor by your name. You're not, you're not press professor of your private practice, you're professor of a medical school, you know, in a medical school, and, and that comes with an obligation for teaching. And, and so I think all of us take that obligation very seriously. And, you know, we really want to make the program the best it can be. And we really want the residents to walk out feeling like they, they can do just about anything, whether they choose to do a fellowship or whether they choose to go into comprehensive. Um, I think some of the strengths of the program are the fact that it's very well balanced. We have, you know, the mothership, which is the Sue Andrews Rogers Eye Center, which is the big, large eye center. Um, then we have a very good children's hospital. It's a top 10 children's hospital right across the street. We have a brand new VA hospital just down the street. And then we have an outstanding county hospital. Uh, it's about 20 minutes away. So our residents rotate through all four hospitals. And I don't really know of any other program that, that, is, that, that is that well balanced. A lot of programs have a VA or they have a county. It's very rare to have a top 10 children's. You know, you've got the academic mothership, you've got VA hospital and a very good county hospital, which is top in the, in, the, in the state for trauma. So that balance is really good. And then having high quality attendings at all these places who really care. And it's a great experience for the residents because they're going to operate with so many different people. And I think that really is a nice opportunity. The other thing is, you know, we don't send our residents out to operate on their own. In some, in some programs, you have third years teaching, second year, second year teaching, first years. Like you will, every case, uh, when you are a resident, will be staffed by an attending. And so I think there's a lot of value in that. And then all of us do things differently. So you're going to pick up bits and pieces that you like about me, bits and pieces you like about other people. Um, and so being able to operate with so many different people is a huge advantage. So I think those things, Colorado is obviously an amazing place to live. I think all of those things contribute to a really outstanding program. We're really proud of the ranking. We hope to move up in the ranking over the next few years as well. No, it's exciting to see and exciting to uh, watch something grow and evolve as, as you all have. And it's, I think it makes the program obviously strong as it is already, but it helps to have that recognition as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the other thing is, uh, I think the, the, the program searchable numbers are very high. I mean, they, there's a lot of exposure to a lot of uh, different types of procedures and yep. there's up to six residents now, I believe as well. So I think that's right. a, it's a, it's a good. Yeah, six residents. And so it's amazing. You know, our numbers have grown as our residents have grown too. So, and, and this is, you know, due to great work by Jeff Suhu, Jasleen Singh, there are, are uh, residency program director and co-residency program director. And so they've really worked hard to make sure the resident numbers stay up. Even with COVID, the numbers have stayed up and we've been able to expand the residency and not sacrifice numbers or quality. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, Dr. Davidson, as we talk about residency, a lot of applicants like myself are in the process of interviewing and, and in a few months we'll be making a rank list. So I'm just wondering when you think back on your career and when you were in that process or if you, as you've mentored others in this process, what do you think are some key factors into making a rank list and what are some things that one should consider when they think about, uh, you know, obviously the algorithm is what decides everything, but what are some things you, yeah. can, you decide between maybe one or two or three or four or however many, what, what really differentiates the programs or what should students yeah. consider when they're thinking about that? That's a great question. I mean, most programs are very good, so you're not going to go wrong and, you know, don't think you have to be in the top 10 or even the top 20. I mean, you're going to get a good education. I think a lot of it is how much you put into it, number one. Um, when I see pay, uh, applicants interviewing and they're taking like tons of notes about the specifics of call or exactly how many cases you get, I wouldn't fixate on that so much. I would fixate more on culture mm -hmm. and, and A, how happy are the current residents and B, how well-rounded is your education going to be? You know. And you do have to worry about numbers a little bit. Like, you know, it, there are some programs where people have to leave and do a fellowship because they don't feel comfortable doing comprehensive. You should never um, join a program that you can't leave and go into comprehensive. Like, you know, even if you know you want to do a fellowship, you should always be able to be saying, you know what, I'm getting enough cases no matter what, I don't have to do the fellowship. So there aren't many of them out there, but there are some out there. Um, and I think culture is really the key. You know, there are some programs that are, I hate to use the word malignant, but more malignant than others in the sense that how they treat the residents, are they treating uh, them with respect? Uh, you know, um, you need to find a place that's gonna treat you with respect. You know, you're still human, you're a smart human, you've graduated med school, you, you wanna be treated with respect. And I remember um, when I was interviewing, you know, sometimes you would just walk into a place and you knew within five minutes it was gonna be terrible and you had to spend the entire day there, which is kind of painful. And, 
it's going to be different when you guys interview through Zoom, but I think you'll get a feel for what the culture is like. And, um, and I think that for me is the most important thing. You know, everyone's smart at this level. You're all smart. Um, you know, you want a place that's going to challenge you. You want a place that's going to give you opportunities. If you have interest, interest outside ophthalmology and research, um, in innovation, you know, our program offers huge opportunities of innovation. Um, you want to see, you know, how that program can meet your needs. But most importantly, I think you want to walk out of a program feeling like you can do anything, you know, that a comprehensive ophthalmologist can do. Obviously not retinal attachment surgery, plastics, things like that, but, but so you don't have to do the fellowship. And I think that's really the key thing. So don't fix it on the number so much. If one program does 220 and the other does 250, you know, you could easily push it and do 250 probably. I, I would focus, you know, make sure there's an appropriate amount of numbers but really focus on the culture and the fit and the diversity of the patient population, because obviously some populations are gonna be less diverse and you will not be exposed to as, as, as many uh, disease processes potentially. You want good pathology and you wanna be challenged. And so, um, you know, the three years goes by so quickly um, that this is the time to do it. This is the time when you have someone by your side 100% of the time and before you know it, you're gonna be out and you don't wanna be out and be like, oh, you know, I never saw that or, oh, I don't know, really know how to approach this. You want to be able to leave feeling like you can do anything. Got it. Yeah, no, I think those are awesome pearls of advice and, and uh, something to keep in mind as we go forward. And like you mentioned, it's a little tougher with Zoom to get the full picture, but, yeah. uh, you know, it should, uh, should be manageable. I think everybody's in the same boat, at least. So that's just yeah. supposed to apply to everybody. So that's one thing, at least. And um, Dr. Sure. Dick, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join me, uh, for being so for so friendly to me as I've texted you the past couple of days about you know setting this up and you've been such giving such uh, pearls of advice that have meant a lot and I think your perspectives are are valued and we'll all hopefully uh, hopefully all the medical students out there who are interested in ophthalmology will listen to this and learn something and for everybody who's applying for residency right now and in the process of interviewing will also take your uh, you know your your advice in terms of thinking about the things that you mentioned as well so I want to thank you so much and uh, hopefully we stay in touch and I meet you in person someday. My pleasure. I would love that. I really appreciate you doing this. I think it's actually a huge value for your listeners. And if I can help in any other way, uh, people can reach out to me. They can get my email address from you or anyone and uh, be happy to help some more. So best of luck as the as you go through the interview process. Thank you so much. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thanks, Paul. Take care. Bye.